Hello, my name is Sarah Selesnyov. I'm from Charles Dickens Research School. I'm also director of the London South Teaching School Alliance. And uh, with a background in school leadership and school improvement, I know exactly how problematic and challenging it can be to really change school practice at whole school level. And this is one of my favourite uh, EEF guidance reports. The implementation report starts with a really nice quote, which I've put on the screen for you here. Um, this explains why implementation is so important to get right for schools. And the guidance report offers six evidence-based recommendations to support you with the implementation process, a as well as a really nice uh, summary of the implementation literature, with a definite focus on the specific challenges of implementation in an education context. By far the overriding message of the report is that implementation is not easy, and it's not quick, but it can work when it's carefully thought through and supported over time. The report begins with this really nice diagram which supports you in understanding the four stages of the implementation process. Firstly, exploring, top right, in which you might be identifying a problem and horizon scanning to explore possible solutions and to match them to your own setting before deciding which one to adopt. Moving down to bottom right then, the preparing stage in which you'll be developing an implementation plan based on an assessment of the school's readiness for the proposed change and then preparing the school for that change through training or infrastructure development. This is interesting what most school leaders would think implementation is, um, but in fact, as you'll see, this is a very small subset of the whole activity. And yet it's what we as school leaders spent most of our time thinking about. And that's perhaps where implementation can go wrong. Moving to bottom left, the delivering stage. This is where there is follow-up support tailored to the needs of individuals. And this follow-up support plans are decided based on information gathered as to the successes and challenges of the innovation. And finally, moving into the stage of sustaining, which is once the new approach is in what's called stable use. This is the scaling up stage. You might be scaling up from one year group or one subject to many. And again, I think as school leaders, we often assume that stable use will be the norm. We train all staff and we think job done, only finding out later that staff either aren't using the new approach or aren't using it in the way that we intended. So what this report is really saying is start small. Don't assume all staff require the same support or will immediately adopt the new approach successfully and plan for a scale up based on your small scale introduction. Moving on now to the six recommendations for the report, and this is the first one. Treat implementation as a process, not an event. Plan and execute it in stages. Um, and I think the, these quotes from that section really corroborate um, what we've read about in the diagram on our previous slide. Implementation can take between two and four years, and it's not a straight, linear uh, kind of approach. It can be challenging and problematic with troughs and peaks. Um, what we often do as school leaders is take on too many projects simultaneously and underestimate how tricky it's going to be to really fully implement any innovation. And finally, the idea that if we're wanting to do something new, we're going to have to stop doing something else. There are some really nice questions in the report uh, that can frame your thinking around this section. I really like the first one and the third one. Do we implement changes across the school in a structured and staged manner? And are there opportunities to make fewer but more strategic implementation decisions and pursue these with greater efforts? Do we as school leaders think about all the different approaches that are being implemented by all the different people who are in our school at any given time? Uh, do we rush in a panicked attempt to solve a problem, which is likely to backfire? And then the last question, are there less effective practices that can be stopped to free up time and resources? What can we stop doing to find the time and energy to do something differently and more effectively. Moving on to the second recommendation now, so create a leadership environment and school climate that is conducive to good implementation. So this is about all the groundwork that leaders need to put in to make sure the school has an atmosphere and a culture that's generally amenable to change, but also ready for any specific innovation. School leaders need to set the stage for implementation through school policies, routines and practices. Make sure you have an organisational climate which supports implementation. So there's collaboration among staff, there's a learning culture, risk taking is perceived to be okay, leaders are trusted and there is some enthusiasm for change. 
Leaders should identify and cultivate leaders of implementation throughout the school. Change can't be led solely from the top, so distributed leadership is really important because middle leaders play a crucial role in the implementation of any innovation. And finally, to build leadership capacity through implementation teams. These are teams of people that have diverse skills and talents and interests that can work together to try and remove the barriers to change. They will need resourcing, they may need some external support, but they will act as your change champions or what's known as opinion formers, advocating for the change and maintaining momentum throughout the implementation process. In this section again there's a series of questions for you to ask yourselves and I really like this final question which I put on the slide. How do day-to-day -day practices affect the motivation and readiness of staff to change? I think that's a really important question. Consider things like workload, well-being, trust, accountability and where your school is on its school improvement journey. Third recommendation, define the problem you want to solve and identify appropriate programmes or practices to implement. This stage is interestingly much slower and more broken down than you might imagine. First thing to do is obviously to identify a priority and the report says that acting on hunches is fine but you need to investigate. Uh, there's a really great um, paper reference at the back of this report by someone called Helen Timpley who talks about spirals of inquiry and that approach is a really great way to, to identify hunches and verify them. Next, gather data that's fit for purpose and here it's nice to see that the report talks about data as being more than just numbers. Um, numbers tell us the what but they don't tell us the why. When we are uh, running uh, implementation projects with schools in the Alliance, we also use interviews with staff and students and obviously it's really important to think who's the best person to interview those people so that the interviewees don't say what you, they think you want them to say and that's especially the case with children. Use surveys such as Google Forms which are really easy and accessible online. Develop focused observations um, that have a really tight focus on the problem that you're trying to tackle. Next, to recognise weakness in the data, there are two really great uh, things you might want to read about this and the references at the end of this report. Um, Katz and Dake uh, write about intentional interruption, which is about avoiding confirmation bias. And Nancy Love talks about a way to approach a data conversation that will help you overcome your own bias and assumptions about what you're going to see in that data. Next, provide credible and plausible interpretations. This is a really great way to present the problem to staff and to gain buy-in for the change that you want to implement. Next, really important to um, decide what is the intervention that we want to select. So in terms of seeking potential solutions to a problem that you've identified, obviously the EEF reports offer some, a great source of ideas. But it's really important not just to read the impact headlines, to read the full report, not just to read the guidance report, but if something takes your eye, go back to the original research material that that uh, concept or that innovation came from. And be critical. Will this innovation work for our pupils in our context and our staff? And then, if that intervention seems like it's the right one for you, make an adoption decision. The next recommendation is about creating a leadership implementation plan, judging the readiness of the school and then preparing staff and resources. So we're in the prepare section of that first diagram we looked at. There is a really great template for an implementation plan uh, and there's an editable version of this on the EEF website so do look out for that. What's really important um, in this stage is to specify the active ingredients of the, prep, of, the, um, of the innovation so that you know through your implementation plan where staff can be tight and where staff can be loose. The active ingredients are the features that really need to be adopted closely to get the intended outcomes. If you're interested in working out how best to do this, there's a really nice paper by Chris Brown which is recommended at the end of this presentation. And generally, the more clearly identified the active ingredients are, the more likely you are to have success. 
Uh, the, this section recommends you developing a theory of change to help support this, and we've definitely found these really, really helpful. There's a really nice, easy-to-read paper from Newcastle University, which we recommend at the end of this presentation. And here's one of the examples of the theories of change from that report that you might want to go and have a little look at. Going on, um, think about having a really uh, focused uh, package of implementation strategies. This is a really nice extract from page 23 in the guidance report, which comes from one of the most extensive implementation research studies that's ever been done, the ERIC report. And it lists uh, nearly 30 um, implementation strategies. It's important to think of having several on the go at the same time um, so that you're meeting everyone's needs within the school. And then define your outcomes, monitor them, um, thoroughly assess the degree to which you're ready to implement the innovation. I think this is a really nice rule of thumb from the report. So implementation readiness is a combination of motivation, general capacity, and innovation specific capacity. And then to do some practical preparation for its use. So create a shared understanding of it and, and provide support and incentives. Introduce new, new skills, have some upfront training, and there's a great um, a set of guidance on page 31 of the report about what that training might look like based on research into effective professional development. And finally, think about the infrastructure that's needed, the technical, admin and governance support, the resources that might need to be put towards the innovation, including time and space and so on. Moving on then to recommendation number five, support staff, monitor progress, solve problems and adapt strategies as the approach is used for the first time. It's interesting the, re the report describes this as a vulnerable stage and that's absolutely right in my experience. Change is a very personal process and everyone experiences it differently. If you want to read one paper about this stage and how to understand how different people are experiencing change, do read the whole paper, which is recommended at the end of this presentation. The recommendations in this section are all about treating those people involved in implementing the innovation as individuals. And the last point on this slide, so make thoughtful adaptations only when the active ingredients are, are securely understood and implemented, is really, really important. Both Hall and Brown, who are referenced at the end of this presentation, talk very sensitively about how to do this. It's interesting that the idea for strict fidelity comes from medicine and health interventions more generally. There's a very nice description of in, what, what the EEF call intelligent adaptation on page 36 of the report. It's hard to get right, but once if it's done, it can be very, very powerful. And finally, recommendation six, plan for sustaining and scaling an intervention from the outset and continu continuously acknowledge and nurture its use. So what's interesting about this stage is it's really a, a mini repeat of all previous stages. It needs the same planning, tracking, monitoring, checking and supporting if you're going to really sustain and embed those new practices in your own school context. So I've reached the end of my explanation. Uh, if you want to check out the EEF website, you will find a, a great uh, set of additional resources to support you in understanding and carrying out implementations. There is an online course with some video case studies. There's the editable implementation plan, which I've showed you in this presentation. There's a guidance report checklist. There's some advice on gathering data, a card sort activity for staff, and much more. So do check that page out. And finally, here are the references that I've referred to throughout the report the, this session. If you're interested in reading more, there are some great readings there, which can really help you get a deep, of under, deep understanding of how to affect um, great implementation. Here's my contact details. Um, do get in touch if you want to know more about implementation and how we manage it at the research school. And do check out our um, sessions which explain the other guidance reports from the EF website. You'll find those on our website. Thank you very much.